theyeshiva.net. Tesvav Ahmed Bey's ten li- around ten lines from the top. The line starts Shesayrif Shesayrif Zubif Neatzma the Zubif Neatzma. The Gemara analyzed at length the explanation of Rish Lakish in the name of Bar Kapara. How Reb Meir derived his halacha. What was his halacha? That a person may bit burn pure truma together with impure truma. Erev Pesach, if both of them are chametz, even though the pure truma is going to be contaminated and become ritually impure during the process. And Reb Meir's expression was, midivrehem labmadnu. We learn it from their words. We didn't know what those words mean. First, we thought it meant from Reb Chanin and Rabbi Akiva came Rish Lakish and said, no, Midivrayim means from the words of the sages, Midivrayim, from Divrei Seifrim, from the words of the rabbis. We have learned this. But which rabbis? Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua. How? First, the Gemara introduced one possible Rabbi Yeshua who believes that if Truma becomes Tome, in a doubtful Tume, meaning you're not sure it's Tome, then Rabbi Eliezer says you still have to safeguard it from Tume. And Rabbi Yeshua says the obligation to safeguard it is gone because he focuses on the word true masi versus true my soy. But the Gemara said that's not a good reference for our halacha because Rabbi Yeshua never said that be a daim, you're allowed to actively be at metame. All he says is you don't have to protect it. You can even bring it into an open room and expose it to the possibility of Tumah. But he never says you're allowed to go and physically, directly contaminate it. Where Reb Meir says you're allowed to actually be metame the Truma Biyadaya. So the Gemara introduced a different source, another Mishnah, same Mesechta, same chapter, Meseches Trumas, where Reb Yeshua taught us, you remember, that if there's a cask, a, uh, a barrel of wine that breaks and it's Truma, and it's going to flow into a reservoir of chulin, which is tamay. Rabbi Yeshua says, you're allowed to save all your chulin wine and take tamay dika vessels and catch the truma wine in those vessels, even though you're being metame the truma wine directly with your hands by bringing the tamay dika vessels into contact with the truma. Why? In order to save the entire reservoir, the entire tube or cistern of chulen wine, which is pure, which will get ruined for everybody if the truma wine falls into it because a kayan won't be able to eat it, of course, because it's tame, and a Yisrael won't be able to eat it because it's truma. So it's going to be ruined for everybody. At least now it's tame and a Jew can eat it. If he wants to eat tame, drink tame de kawan, he can drink tame de kawan. The moment the truma mixes into it, right, everyone loses. A Yisrael can't eat it, can't drink it because it's truma, and a Kayan can't because it's Tameh. So just one second, so Rabbi Yeshua says, ah? Ah, so if he has tired Dika vessels, for sure you do that. For sure you have to do that. And even if he has one tired Dika vessel and he can only save a few ounces, let's say you have one tired Dika cup and you could save only a few ounces of Truma, you have to do that. But if you don't have, so the only option is, do you let it flow on its own and become tame by the laws of gravity, or you're metame it? Rebbe Lezer says, let it flow into the reservoir and become tame on its own and be metame all the chul. And Rabbi Yeshua says, no, we want to protect a Jew from a loss of money, and therefore we let you be metame the truma be your dime. How could you? The Torah says you're not allowed to. The Torah says you're not allowed to. How can you make these financial calculations? The answer is, because Rabbi Yeshua holds, that since it's anyway going to be lost, this truma is not going, now it could still be drunk. You could still drink it. But in a few minutes, in three minutes, two minutes, one minute, 30 seconds, whatever time it takes, this truma is lost. It won't be able to be edible anymore. It won't be able to be eaten. You won't be able to drink it. Why? Because it's going to become tame. So Rabbi Yeshua holds that on that truma that is destined, destined to be disqualified from eating, it's going to be lost to the mitzvah. There's no obligation to protect it. There's even permission to make it tame. The whole issue of making it tummy doesn't apply anymore. Why? Because he believes that since in reality it's going to be lost anyway, it's not going to be eaten, you could already be at metame now. This is a good source for a mayor. Since it's Erev Pesach, it's in the morning, 
It's going to be burnt. I don't have anybody to eat it. It's going to be burned. If I have somebody to eat it, of course, you give it to somebody to eat. You don't be metame. It's going to be burned. It's going to be destroyed. And it will not be able to be eaten because it has to go into a fire. So what's the halacha? I could be at metame. Such thing as selling to a guy. No. You don't have to sell it. Then. No. You don't have to burn it. No. Like, if I cared, you're not allowed to. You you're going to be makshal a guy with trumo. Yeah, yeah. There is a problem with the case. The case is like... If it didn't start to drip into Poland, then you can put the two with the from the beginning. But if already started to drip, if Truman started to drip into Poland, we are already at loss. It's useless to put the two with the now because that Poland is already. You're right. If it already fell into the Poland, it's the useless. Why should you be a Matama? Right. So the question is, if it didn't yet. Drip, yeah, it's about. about to drip, and then you put it yeah, yeah. Then it's you about. You You're saving, yeah? Save exactly. Of Exactly, exactly. The question, how, how is this case is possible? Because it looks like the case was that it's already started to drip. That's why we're looking for... No, it broke. The barrel broke. Yeah, but it, did but it, did, it didn't start dripping. Or, or maybe there's still a flat surface. I mean, you know, you could, maybe there's a flat surface. Maybe you, maybe you, got, maybe you got your three minutes or your 40 seconds. Yeah. And if you can divert the flow into, you know, a big keli, you have a big garbage can or whatever it is, but it's a tamadika keli. You have this big metal or whatever keli. It's tame. You're going to get all the wine. You'll save your reservoir of tamadika wine, but you're going to be metame your truma. And Rabbi Yeshua says, yes. Rabbi Elezer says, you're not allowed. And halacha is like Rabbi Yeshua. And that's what's Rabbi Meir's source for our halacha. Since... It's not going to be edible anyway. The mitzvah will not be able to be fulfilled. Why? It's going to perish. You're not going to be able to do this mitzvah with the chametz or with the swine. So therefore I say, you're allowed to be it metame. Be yadayim. If you have a good reason for it. Here you have a good reason. The reason is you want to save your chulen. Here you want to make one fire. Rabbi Yeshua says yes. Maya. Oh, oh, yeah. so Maya. Yeah. yeah, you're right. If you have a ratio ratio of a hundred to one, chulin over truma, it will be bottle, and you're good. Yes. If you have, if you have, let's say, one ounce of truma that falls in, but you have a hundred ounces of chulin, you're good. You'll take out one ounce and give it to a client just symbolically because it belongs to a client, because one ounce is truma, but you could drink everything else. If you have even a thousand ounces of truma, but you have a ratio of 100 to 1, right? You have, let's say, one gallon of truma, but you have a ratio of 100 to 1, you're good. The problem, of course, is that if all the wine falls in, you're not going to have that bittle. But if it's just started, it's already a drip. Right, 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 right. Right. What do we gain from this explanation in Reb Meir's words? We also gain a big chiddush, as Rashi explains. If we say Reb Meir learned it from Reb Chanina, Reb Chanina said that you're allowed to be metame, basar carbon, and bump up the tumma when you're about to burn it by burning it with basar that has a higher degree of tumma, and that's where Reb Meir learned it. And Reb Meir is comparing and saying that something that is forbidden to eat like Truma, Erev Pesach, which is Chametz, which you're not allowed to eat. Yeah. You're not allowed to eat it rabbinically, 11 o'clock. And you're going to compare that to Truma. That was Tame, and you're not allowed to eat it. And he says, you're allowed to make it more Tame. And Rabbi Akiva says, you're allowed to take it from Posel to Tame. And that's where you're learning this halacha, that when something is Tame or Posel, it's something that you can't eat. And the chametz you also can't eat. And if you can't eat it, therefore, you're allowed to be at metame. But from there, we only learn that you're allowed to burn it when it becomes not edible anymore. When it becomes not edible, then it's something that you're allowed to burn because it's not edible anyway. So then you can only do it at 11 o'clock in the morning. But from Rabbi Yeshua's source, we know you can even do it 8 o'clock in the morning. Because the idea is not that it's not edible right now. The idea is that it's destined to be inedible, and therefore, even 8 o'clock in the morning, I would be able to be metami the truma, as long as I know for sure that I can't get a kayan. If I can get a kayan, then I'm not allowed to do it till 11 o'clock. 
because if you know that it's not getting lost, right, this wine, if I could save it, I have to save it. So if I could go call a Kayan and say, hey, come eat the truma, then I have to do that. But if let's say I'm somewhere stuck on an island, theoretically, and I know that there's no Kayan around, and I'm not a Kayan, or I can't eat it for whatever reason. So now I could burn it even nine o'clock in the morning. Why? Because it's destined to get lost. Just like this truma now, the wine, it's destined to go le'ibud. You can't save it. So therefore, you could be at Metame right now. You don't say right now it's, it's, it's edible. It's edible now, but in five minutes, it's not going to be. So really right now, I could be at Metame. So the same would be with the chametz on Pesach. On this, the Gemara said, Reb Nachman agrees with this analysis of Rish Lakish. He has the same shit. And when Rava asked Reb Nachman that there's a whole b'risa where Reb Yoisi clearly rejects Reb Meir based on the fact that the comparison with Reb Chanina is ill-advised because Reb Chanina is talking about something that's Tameh and Reb Akiva is talking about something that's Puzzle. Reb Yoisi didn't challenge him from a case of Reb Yehoshua. He challenged him from the case of Reb Chanina. The Gemara answered that Reb Yoisi misunderstood Reb Meir. He thought Reb Meir is learning out his lesson from Reb Chanina's Ganakoyanim. So he challenged him. Reb Meir said, no, my source was Reb Yehoshua. And Reb Yoisi then disagreed even with the source of Reb Yehoshua, which we have to explain why. But that's where the Gemara is holding. And according to this last line, it comes out very interestingly that the Mishnah opens up with Reb Chanin and Reb Akiva, not only because we're talking about the concept of burning Tameh with tar, but it's actually connected to Psachim, because Reb Yoisi thought that Reb Meir is learning his halacha from there. So the practical scenario was they were sinning in the base Medrash. This is the century after the destruction of the second base Hamikdash. This is the, the century of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir was a, a student of Rabbi Akiva, very close to Rabbi Akiva. <coughs> Rabbi Yossi was a colleague, Rabbi Yeshua was a colleague. This is all the generation after the destruction of the second base Hamikdash. And Rabbi Akiva lived a very long life. He was murdered at the end. But Rabbi Akiva lived at the end of Bayez Sheni. Rabbi Akiva lived at the end of Bayez Sheni. Uh, yeah, Rabbi Akiva was killed approximately in the year 136 after the Common Era. The Beis Hamikdash was destroyed approximately the year 70. So Rabbi Akiva lived around 60 years. He, died, he passed away, or was killed, around 60, 70 years after the Chorban. That's the general estimation. Because Rabbi Akiva supported the Bar Koichva revolt. The Bar Koichva revolt happened around 60 years after the destruction of the second base Hamikdash, around the year 130, 132. It lasted for a few years very successfully, and then it was cut down in Betar, also on Tisha B'av, right? The last stand of the Jews against the Romans was cut down on Tisha B'av in Betar, and the Jews of Betar were slain, Bar Koichel was killed, and Rabbi Akiva was one of the great sages who was killed. He goes into the list of the Asar Rige Malchus. So he lived already at the end of the era of Bayesheni. So he saw the second base Hamikdash. It was already the end of it, and then he lived another, um, actually he was an adult because Rabbi Akiva lived to a very, very old age and he was killed around 60, 70 years after the Chorban. So he was already an adult at the end of Bayez Sheni. Rabbi Chanina's Gan HaKoyanim worked in the Bayez Sheni. He was this Gan HaKoyanim. He was the deputy, deputy Koyan Gadol. So they're sitting in the base Madrash and they're discussing the testimony of Rabbi Chanina. Rabbi Chanina was also killed. Rabbi Chanina's Gan HaKoyanim was also killed. Uh... It's really incredible that a lot of these people were literally killed by the Romans. But uh, where is Rome today? Where is Rome? Where is the Roman Empire? In Wikipedia. And where is Reb Chanina's Gana Kainam and Kiva? Right here. We're learning their words. We're learning their halachas. So they're sitting in the base Madrash. Somebody is sharing the testimony of Reb Chanina. It's not him himself. Somebody is sharing it. Somebody is sharing the testimony of Rabbi Akiva. Right? Somebody, Reb Meir, Reb Yishu, or maybe it was Reb Akiva himself, Reb Meir says, somebody is talking about Reb Eleazar and Reb Yeshua's uh, uh, conversations. Reb Meir intervenes into the conversation and says, from their words, from their words, we learn that you're allowed to burn Trumat with Trumat Meir. Reb Yossi thinks Reb Meir is referring to that which was thus discussed Reb Chanina. He says, you're wrong, wrong comparison. Rabbi Meir you misunderstood me. I'm referring to another conversation, which is Rabbi Lezer, Rabbi Yeshua. When we can understand that this is a recording of a living base medrash, the Gemara, I wonder, the Gemara essentially, Talmud Bavli, if I could use this metaphor, I know it's an incomplete one, but it's maybe not such a bad metaphor, is really, 
You know, you say, I wish I would have been, uh, what's the expression? A fly on the wall watching what happened. Or today we'll say a video camera on the wall. A lot of Talmud Bavli is like a video camera recording what happened in the base measures. That's why you can go from topic to topic to topic to topic to topic. It's a live conversation. Somebody will mix in, somebody will refute, somebody will bring in something else. It's literally a living discussion. So Reb Meir understood one way, and then Reb, Reb Yossi understood one mahalach, and Reb Meir corrected him, and Reb Yossi understood that he wasn't referring to Reb Hanin, he was referring to Reb Yeshua. Right. People have a conversation in no. relation to people. No, someone will say Medivrayim somebody else. You would say who the other person was. No, well, Medivrayim from the words of the sages. Understand. It could be it was five minutes earlier, that's my point. Weren't they just discussing Medivrayim? So they, they would also discuss Medivrayim, but they would also discuss Because it's all the halachas. It doesn't look like it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the, there's a proof for it, because Rabbi Yossi says, I disagree with you, Reb Meir. Umaydim Rebbe Lezer, Rebbe Yeshua. They're both maida. Why is he mixing in Rebbe Lezer and Rebbe Yeshua? That was Rish Lakish's source, that he's talking about Rebbe Yeshua. It seems like there's a very easy way to see why Rebbe Meir doesn't follow, according to Rebbe Meir, Rebbe Yeshua, because both, both yeah. the first of all, say, Al-Tumasa. There's no Moisif Tuma, right. There's no Hesafas Tuma. That's where it was refuted. That's where it was refuted. Says the Gemara, Vamai Einahi Amida. You see Tasvava Medbeis, 10 lines from the top. Line starts Shesoyref. Vamai Einahi Amida. Why didn't Reb Yossi accept the words of Reb Meir? Why Einahi Amida? Why is Reb Meir's halacha that he learned from Reb Yeshua incorrect? Einahi Amida means it's not a good libud. Mido midahi. <laughs> Mido midahi means it's a midah and a midah. Meaning it's an absolute good source. Rabbi Yeshua is a great source that you're allowed to be metame, truma tahira, erev pesach, when you have to burn chametz. Because what now it's tar, but what is its destination? Its destination is it's going to become inedible. It's going to be burnt. You have to burn it. It's erev pesach. It's going to be burnt. It's going to be inedible. Right? Inedible and burnt, both. You're not going to be able to eat it because it's Pesach. It's also going to be burnt because you have to burn chametz before Pesach, Tashbisu. And what does Rabbi Yeshua say? Exactly the same thing. The wine is right now perfect, but it's on its way of being burnt. Not being burnt, but going into reservoir of Tame, which means being destroyed. Being destroyed in the sense that it will not be able to be something that you could drink afterwards. We don't mean physically destroyed. It's not going to be destroyed, but it's going to be something that you're not going to be able to do anything with it. It's going to become Tamed and you're going to have to ultimately dispose it, get rid of it, burn it. So it's going to that place, to the place where it's not going to be drinkable and it's going to have to be burnt. And Rabbi Yeshua said, because that is what's going to happen, therefore, and you cannot avoid that. You cannot avoid that. So already now, you have no obligation to keep it away from Tumma, you're even allowed to be at Metama B'yadayim. All the halachas, they're not allowed to be Metama Truma, don't apply. Why? Because it applies only to Truma that you can eat, that you can do the mitzvah. And if you're Metama it, you're destroying the mitzvah. Here, you can't do the mitzvah with it. There's nothing, unfortunately. It's lost. The mitzvah of eating cannot be done. That's gone. So a Truma, we can't do the mitzvah ever again because it's going to be destroyed and Tame, or it's going to be Pesach and burnt. What's the halacha? You can eat Metama. It's a great source. Why does Rabbi say, Eine mina mida? It is mina mida. Mido mida? Givaldika source. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Yossi argues, shiny hasa. It's different. The Ike hefset chulin. You can't prove it from Rabbi Yeshua. Maybe you're right, but maybe you're wrong. And since the burden of proof is on Rabbi Meir, you're the one who has to prove it 100%, not me. Because by Rabbi Yeshua, you can argue that really there is an Isra to be at Matama Biyadaya. The rabbis, at least, would not let you take Truma and be at Metame. They canceled out the decree here because Ike Hefset Chulim. You want to protect a Jew from losing a huge amount of money of the mundane wine because when it becomes Tame, nobody can drink it anymore. The Kayan can't drink it because it's Tame Truma, and the Israel can't drink it because it has Truma inside. So you're done. Hefset Chulim. They did not want a Jew should lose so much money, and that was always a consideration of the Chazal to protect the financial interests of people, and therefore they let you be metama the truma. But here, there's no hefsed. Ah, okay, one second, one second. 
Certainly not that half sit. So Rabbi Yeshua will say, you're not allowed to be metamit truma taira. Now Rabbi Meir might say, you're wrong. Rabbi Yossi says, the burden of proof is on you, not on me. You're the one who's being mechadish that you could take pure truma and contaminate it. Even though you have no big half sit, nothing, you're not going to lose a lot of money. Make another fire. Still, you say you're allowed to do it. And you're bringing a proof from Rabbi Yeshua. You don't have conclusive proof. I can argue that Rabbi Yeshua is matter over there, Medir Abonan, to do it because there is a hefset. In other words, Rabbi Yeshua agrees that Minatayra, you're allowed to be at Metame. Because if he would hold it Minatayra, you're not allowed to be at Metame, a hefset wouldn't cancel out that Isser. He holds that Minatayra, you're allowed to do it. But Medir Abonan, he may hold that it's forbidden. The reason it's permitted over there is only because there's a big hefset, a big loss of money involved. Okay, so Gemara is going to say, Maske for Rabbi Yirmiya. Rabbi Yirmiya asked a question on Rabbi Yossi's answer. In our Mishnah also, there is a hefset of eitz. There's a loss of lumber. Because if I have to make a second fire, I need new logs in order to separate the pure trauma from the impure trauma because I can't burn it together. So Rabbi Yeshua will say, okay, listen. I don't want a Jew should lose money. He has to take logs. These logs are going to end up in the fire. They're going to be destroyed. Wood is expensive. It's a hefset. And therefore, I would allow it. There was an old man. He told Rabbi Yermiyah, Rabbi Yaisi can argue very well that the Chachamim were chayshish for a big hefset, for a big loss of money. A small loss they were not concerned about it, and they didn't allow you to be metametrum and You can't compare the loss of money of a reservoir that may have a huge amount of wine. It's not necessarily of a gallon of wine. It, remember, this was a reservoir. This was a wine press. It could be you had their wine that was fermenting for seven months. How much wine did you have? Wine that can produce perhaps hundreds or thousands and thousands of gallons, support somebody for a year or two. It may be, it may not be, but the point is that you're dealing here with a situation where there's going to be an enormous, enormous financial loss, not just financial loss, a loss of work and time, which is all finances, a loss of time and resources. And again, these were not things that you took for granted. <laughs> Everything was very, very precious. So I understand that the Chachamim said, you know what? It's important for us to cancel out our gzeira, not to be metamet truma biyadayim. But here, it's a hefzid, I understand. But what is it? A couple of logs, a couple of pieces of wood, a couple of twigs. It's also a hefzid, it's something. But you can't compare it. Everything is relative. Hahusava, the old man. You're right, you're right. We're talking in a general... You're right, it could be the fellow with the wine is, is a multi-millionaire and it doesn't mean anything. And this guy is, is an animara. But generally... You know, you, there's an expression of the Rambam. Why can't you throw it in later? Because huh? Why can't you throw it in later once the tum is burned? So Zion, you'll wait till the tummy gets you burned. You you, you'll throw it in later, but you'll need another piece of wood to sustain the fire, whatever. You're right. If the, you mean if the trum is completely gone, it becomes right, ashes, right, right. then you'll throw... It's, it's not there. Yeah, but to, to hold the fire that long, you're gonna, it's like a new fire. To, to wait till that trum is completely burnt up and the tumor will not spread anymore... You need it. You need it to be completely burnt up. So you're gonna need a. You're gonna have to add what? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Toisvus says in Chulin that when the Gemara says Ahu Sav, it means Elio Anavi. It's a Toisvus in Chulin. When it says Ahu Sav, an old man, it's a euphemism for Elio Anavi. <laughs> so no, no, even a Yachid, even if it's the wine of a Yachid. But it's a hefsid miruba. No, he wasn't saying it as a navi. He was just saying, explaining the Gemara. He wasn't saying it as a navi. He was telling Rabbi Yirmiya why Rabbi Yossi is has a point against Rabbi Meir. In other words, there's a machlekas between Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yossi holds that really you're not allowed to be metamet truma biyadayim according to Rabbi Yeshua. Where there's a hefzid, the Chachamim said you're allowed. Where the mayor says, I disagree, you misunderstood Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Yeshua holds that the moment that the truma is going to a destiny where it's going to become an edible, you're allowed to be it metame, be a dayim. All the halachas of guarding the truma are off. It's like chulim. 
You could treat it like chulin in the sense of being metamayit. Irrelevant if you're going to lose money or not. And that's why, even if there's a hefzit, a small hefzit, I don't care. So it's really two ways of learning Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Yossi learned Rabbi Yeshua. Yeah. Rabbi Yossi learned Rabbi Yeshua says that if there's a hefzit, the Chachamim said you're allowed to. But if not, you still have to protect the truma. At least you're not allowed to be metama be a dayan. You can't directly be with them. That's why with the truma, you're not allowed to throw it into the fire. Make another fire. Reb Meir says, no, all the bets are over. The moment it's going to perish, the moment the truma is going to become inedible for sure, there's nothing you can do about it. Already right now, all the bets are off. You could be at Metama B. Diamond. I'll tell you the Rabbanon, you're good. I don't care about Hefzit. It's a different way of learning it. In other words, Reb Meir is much more lenient. No, Reb Meir doesn't defend himself. Reb Yoisi rejected Reb Meir. So the Gemara says, what's the rejection? Mido Meir. The rejection is because by Reb Yeshua there's a hefzid. So Reb Yermia said, here there's also a hefzid. So an old man told Reb Yermia, your question is not a question. It's a very small hefzid. Oh, so Reb was trying to defend Reb Yermia and reject Reb Yoisi. Reb Yermia was an Amayri. He was much later. But he was trying to reject Reb Yoisi. So the old man mixed in and said, Reb Yermia, no. Reb Yoisi has a good point. Because this is a hefzid mort. So there's two ways of understanding Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Meir has one perspective. Rabbi Yossi disagrees. Yes. That even if you're directly being metame the truma, it's fine. Because it's hoylech le'ibud. It's going to its extermination. It's going to waste anyway. There's no way you can do the mitzvah. There's no way you can eat it. And the whole reason you're not allowed to be at metame is so you should be able to do the mitzvah to be able to eat it purely here. You can't, unfortunately. It's getting lost in the in the in the in the reservoir of wine, or it's getting lost in the Pesach prohibition of eating chametz, and you have to burn it in both cases. And therefore, both halachically and practically, it's going to be inedible halachically because you're not allowed to eat chametz on Pesach. You're not allowed to drink tamedik uh, truma, and practically, both of them are going to be burnt. So on every level. This is becoming inedible, both physically and halachically. It's becoming inedible, spiritually and physically. And therefore, in this case, all the requirements are down, even if you directly are metameyit. This is the shit of Reb Meir, which Reb Yossi disagrees with. Yeah, you have to say it's rabbinic. No, but there could be both, even if it's t- t- even if it's t- Right. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. It could be the Tumma was Minatari also. But by them, the Rabbana no Minatari. Right, they're not busy here. The point is, I could take a Kaili that's Tommy. It sounds like even if it's Tommy Minatari and be Metama the Tumma. Even if it's not, he doesn't say only if it's a Tumma de Rabbana. Any Kaili that's Tommy and it's going to be Metama the Tumma. Let's say the Kaili is a, is a Rishan. Let's say the Kaili touched a, a dead mouse, right? And it didn't go to the mikvah. So this keli is a rishon, and when I catch the wine of truma, the wine of truma is becoming a sheni. So that's going to be, it's going to be metame the truma. There's no two ways about it. Nonetheless, I'm allowed to do it according to Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Leza says you're not allowed to do it. Says the Gemara, ah? So midivreya means from Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Eliezer. Yeah, the reason he says midivrei hem is because, as we learned, whenever there's an argument between Rabbi Lezer and Rabbi Yeshua, in Tumah and Tavah, the Allah was like Rabbi Yeshua. There were a few exceptions. I think it says that there were four things they passed in like Rabbi Lezer and Taras. But the rest of it, the Allah was like Rabbi Yeshua. So that's why midivrei hem, since we accept Rabbi Yeshua over Rabbi Lezer, I know that I could, I could burn this truma, but Rabbi Yossi disagrees. Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yossi. So it's uh, yeah. According to the BIC, if there's a Hefzid Meruba, oh, if the truth. No, no, no. no, no, no. Then nobody holds you a lot of bit Matama. Oh, you're saying Rabbi Yeshua. What, what, what are you trying to gain? What, I mean, it's all Zayn Yeah, I mean, if it's going into a sewer, but it's not going to affect anything else, so what do you have to be Matama for? Stam, I mean. You understand? Here, there's a real question. It's going to become tummy on its own, or you could make it tummy. But when it becomes tummy on its own, it's going to create a tremendous financial loss. Hefzid Barub. 
Amr Reb Asi, Amr Reb Yoichanon. Reb Asi said in the name of Reb Yoichanon, till now we explained Reish Lakish and Reb Nachman's perspective on the Mishnah. Now Reb Asi quotes Reb Yoichanon with a whole new insight into the Mishnah. Machloikis b'sheish, avol b'sheva divri hakel surf. I want you to know, the debate between Reb Meir and Reb Yoisi was only about the sixth hour. Let's say, Sunrise is 6 o'clock and midday is 12 o'clock, just for simplicity purposes. The Kbachlaikus is 11 o'clock in the morning. The rabbi said, yeah, burn Chametz an hour earlier because they were afraid for confusions, right? So therefore they said 11 o'clock. That's the debate. If I burn Chametz 11 o'clock in the morning, can I burn the truma that is pure with the truma that's impure? Avo B'Sheva. But if what if I delay the burning to the 7th hour, meaning 12 o'clock p.m.? Then divrei hakel sarfen. Everybody, including Rabbi Yossi, holds you allowed to burn pure truma with impure truma. Why? This is a new chiddush of Rabbi Yochanan. He says the whole argument was only when there's a rabbinic obligation to burn, not when there's a biblical obligation to burn. Because he holds that since at 12 o'clock, biblically you have to burn chametz. In other words, biblically it's inedible. So then Rabbi Yossi holds it has the same status like tamed truma. That's the chiddush of Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yossi holds that if you're not allowed to eat truma biblically, it's just like saying it's tamay. Just like you could take truma tamayah and touch it to truma tamayah, because it's tamay already. Here too, if it's inedible, it's like tamay. Why? Because what's the reason that if it's tamay, you could be at metame more? The point is because the tumma is not doing anything, it's already tamay. So Rabbi Yochanan holds that if biblically it's inedible, so even though it's tahir de ketruma, but since you're not allowed to eat it anymore, so if you're not allowed to eat it, he holds it's pointless to guard it because you anyway can't eat it. So therefore, I don't care if it becomes tame. It's treated just like tame de ketruma, even though it's not, it's pure. So the Mela Erev Pesach, 11 o'clock, Rabbi Yossi argues. Why? Because 11 o'clock, biblically, you can eat it. So if I'm metame it, what am I doing? I'm making... Truma that's pure, ritually impure and inedible. But that's only 11 o'clock. 12 o'clock, let's say you don't do anything. What happens with this truma? Nothing. You're not allowed to eat it. You have to burn it. Huh? It's not possible. It's not tummy. But he holds you allowed to be at metame because it's like tummy. That's the vart of Rabbi Yechanan. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a chiddush of Rabbi Yechanan that the whole machloikas is only the sixth hour, not the seventh hour. In other words, Rabbi Yochanan, your Teufus, Rabbi Yochanan is saying that truma tmeya and truma that's inedible are identical. In the seventh, seventh hour. Huh? In the seventh hour. Because the 11th, in the, in the sixth hour, it's edible. It's edible biblically. So from a biblical perspective, I'm taking good truma, I'm throwing it into a fire, and I'm being a metame. How did you do that? It was good. Eat it. Oh, I can't eat it because the rabbi said I'm not allowed to eat chametz at 11 o'clock. That's your problem. What do you want from the truma? Min ha the truma was good truma and you impurified it. You contaminated it and you were allowed to eat it. You weren't because of a rabbinic prohibition. But min ha you're allowed to eat it. So min ha there's a problem of being metamayit because it's edible. But 12 o'clock, also Taira says you're not allowed to eat it. So if Torah says you're not allowed to eat it, I didn't take truma that I can eat and be at metame, because Torah says 12 o'clock, you're not allowed to eat chametz anymore. It's awesome and not Torah. Tashbisu, you have to destroy it. So if Torah says it's inedible and you have to destroy it, then Rabbi Yossi would say, I don't care if you metame it. It's already like tame. For all practical, what's the difference of tame and inedible? Tame means it's tame. What's tame? You're not allowed to eat it. Chametz 12 o'clock is not tame, but it's inedible. You can't eat it. You're not allowed to eat it. You have to burn it. So it's the same thing. In other words, there's nothing you can do with it. You can't eat it. You can't do a mitzvah with it. So there's no point to protect it. So therefore, you can... Uh, you can. So you can burn it in the same fire according to everybody. That's Rabbi Yochanan's shit. Take a look in Ashi. Machleikas b'sheish. Machleikas b'sheish. Sha'a. Machleikas b'sheish. It's... Uh, it's parallel to where the Gemara is. Shaddai in Eina la Tahir el Issa de Rabbonon. In the sixth hour, there's only an Issa de Rabbonon. Avol b'sheva shenesu kvar minatayra. But the seventh hour, where it's prohibited minatayra, chametz is prohibited minatayra by chatzois. It says, Tashbisu. Ein l'chatum agdoi l'mizu. 
you can get greater Tumah. Then the Torah is saying, this is bad for you. Get rid of it. You can get more Tumah. So let's understand the Chiddush of Rabbi Yochanan. You could say a different Mahalach, which actually in the beginning of the Sugya, that was the Mahalach that we accepted, which is why we had a problem with learning Rabbi Meir from Rabbi Chanina. You could argue that Tumah and Isur are not the same reality. That's what you're saying. Tumah and Isur are two separate things, not like Rashi is saying. You could say like this. Isur means it's inedible. I can't eat it, right? But it's, it's pure truma. I just can't eat it because the Torah says I can't eat it. I got it. But the meat is not, tum- the truma is not tummy. It's not impure. It's pure. It's beautiful. In other words, an hour ago, you could have eaten it. If it wouldn't be Pesach now, everybody, a Kayan can eat it. It's just now because of the time, I can't eat it. But the bread is pure. It's pure. Tummy means it's not pure. It's tummy. There's a din of tummy in it, right? If it touches, if a carbon touches it, it's going to become tummy. Or puzzle, however you want to define it. Right. Tummy, so you could argue, you could look at it in two ways, and it's not so clear how you look at it halachically. Let's go both ways. You can argue that the fact that something is not roy to eat, it's not roy for the mitzvah, doesn't allow you to be metameyit. It's true, I can't eat it. You're right. But maybe there's a mitzvah not to be metame truma, even if you can't eat it. In other words, you have to understand, why does the Torah say, I should keep my truma pure? I could say for two reasons. One is practical. Because I want you to eat it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I would love to see you eat it. And if you make it impure, you won't be able to eat it. What would be the ramifications of that? If I anyway can't eat it, make it impure. Right? Or you could say, no. The Torah wants that this is sacred. It should remain sacred. If you can't eat it, okay. I wish you could. You can. But you're not going to make it impure. Torah says you have to protect Truma. You have to protect Truma. That would be a big difference. So if it's Tomei already, it's Tomei. The infection is there. <laughs> so maybe you can be mice of Tomei because it's already, you know, the infection is there. So to speak. I'm just calling it an infection. I don't mean Tomei is an infection. But if it's not Tomei, even though I can't eat it, I can't make it tame. That's one way of looking at it. That's why the Gemara initially refuted the idea that Reb Meir learned it from Reb Chanina. Because Reb Chanina is talking about tame. Reb Yochanan, however, introduces a new concept. Reb Yochanan says, that's not the case. Tume and Isur are identical. If the Torah says you can't eat it, Rashi says you can't get more tume. Ein l'cha tume g'day Titus says that this is, this is a piece of evil for you. <laughs> this is evil for you. I don't mean evil as evil. Huh? What? You're right. It can't be metame. I know that. If the chametz touches a carbon, nothing is going to happen to the carbon. He's not saying it's tumah. Rashi is not making a chiddush here that chametz, Erev Pesach, becomes tame. If it touches a carbon, it's not... Huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In other words, if the vart is that the truma is inedible, and that's why it's allowed you allowed to be mice of tumma, so then here it's also inedible. And like Rashi says, the gather of tumma means that what? What does the gather of tumma here mean? Gather of tumma is you can't come in contact with it. You're not allowed to eat it. He says, where do you have a better tumma than this? Chametz on Pesach. Chametz on Pesach. What? Yeah, exactly. A koyin, maybe Rashi means, maybe Rashi even means, a koyin who eats truma tmeya is over on a lav. Yeah? Uh, a person who eats chametz on Pesach, it's an isakaris. So which is the bigger tumma? <laughs> What's less edible? You're allowed to be nana from truma tmeya, but a koyin who eats it, it's a lav, but not a karis. No, chametz is aserbano. So you can't say that they're the same. You can say there's no greater yeah. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So, Mela Rabbi Yochanan holds the reason you're allowed to be Moisif Tuma on Truma Tmeya is not because only Tuma. It's because it's not edible, because you can't do the mitzvah. You understand? Once you can't do the mitzvah, biblically, I don't care if you make it more Tomei. Even the Yosi holds, even the Yosi holds, that there's no prohibition to be metame something 
that's not edible minatayra. And that's why Cham, it's 12 o'clock, you could be metame. Just like Tumah makes it inedible, Isur Chabetz makes it inedible. And the reason you're not allowed to make it tummy is because you want to be able to do the mitzvah. Here you can't do the mitzvah. You're not allowed to eat it. Minatayra. Rabbi Yossi says, Pajalista, go make it tummy. That's Rabbi Yochanan's shita. Go ahead. Amal Rabbi Zayda. The Bzeda says to Rabasi, to Rabasi, Rabasi called Rabbi Yochanan. Neymar, if so, let us perhaps say that Kasavar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan holds that Masnissin Ba'avatumah Doi Raisa. The Mishnah is talking about a case where the meat was tummy from an Avatumah that's biblical. Let's say the meat touched the dead sherets. Uvlad Atumah Dirabonah. And the second piece of meat was tummy from Avlad Atumah, meaning it was a Shlishi. And you burn them together and you bump up the tumma. Umay midivreim. And what does Reb Meir mean? Midivreim labmadnu. Midivri Reb Chanin is gonna koyanim. For the words Reb Chanin is gonna koyanim. In other words, Reb Yochanan would disagree with Reish Lakish, who said Reb Meir learned it from Reb Yeshua, and he would say, no, Reb Meir really learned it from Reb Chanin is gonna koyanim. Why? Because according to this, according to this, the Ava Tumma is Dairaisa, Vlada Tumma is Dairabonon. Because he holds that if it's 12 o'clock, even Rabbi Yossi would agree that you're allowed to burn. You're allowed to burn the trumas together. The whole machlaikas is when? 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, it's only rabbinically prohibited. So perhaps Rabbi Yochanan, you have to say, he learned Rabbi Meir from Rabbi Chanin is Ganakayan. And he learned that Rabbi Chanin is talking about that one meat was Tomei de Rabbana. It was a Shlishi de Rabbana. When you put it in the fire, it gets upped. One level by touching the other bossa, which was a rishon, so it becomes a sheni. And since it was tummy, the rabbanan, it means biblically it was edible, because it was tummy only with the rabban. Only rabbinically it's inedible. And nonetheless, he says you're allowed to make it tummy, right? Even though biblically it's edible, Reb Chanina would say you're allowed to make it tummy. So this is where Reb Meir learned his halacha. That 11 o'clock, you're allowed to be mitami truma, even though the truma is tarred, because rabbinically, it's inedible. And that would be enough. And Rabbi Yossi would argue with that. So should we say that that's what Rabbi Yochanan holds, that the Mishnah is talking about, Rabbi Chanin is gana kayenim, that's Rabbi Meir's source. And he's talking about the truma with a piece of meat that was only tamay mi de ra bonam. So just like Rabbi Chanin has said, you're allowed to take meat that's tummy mid rabbana. And you're allowed to burn it with meat that's tummy min He would also hold you're allowed to take truma of chametz that's awesome mid rabbana and burn it together with truma tmeya min ha Even though this truma is edible min ha because mid rabbana it's inedible. Is that the pshat in Reb Yochanan? In Reb Yochanan. And and that's why Rabbi Yochanan said that the Machloikis is only about 11 o'clock not 12 o'clock this would make a lot of sense why is the Machloikis only 11 o'clock not 12 o'clock because 11 o'clock rabbinically it's inedible 12 o'clock biblically it's inedible and everybody would hold you allowed to do it Rabbi Yossi would never argue about that right Rabbi Yossi only argues about 11 so Rabbi Yochanan is learning his halacha from Rabbi Meir, learning it from Rabbi Chanina. Rabbi Chanina says that even 11 o'clock you're allowed to burn the chametz. Why? Make me why? Rabbi Meir says, because look what he says by meat. The meat is tamay only midir So biblically it's edible, and yet, he says, you could be maisif tomal tomasai. This Rabbi Yossi says, no, 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 no. You're going too far. But 12 o'clock, Rabbi Yossi would agree. Machlaikas is only about 11 o'clock. So you'll say Rabbi Yochanan learns his words from, Rabbi Meir learns his words from Rabbi Chanina, and Rabbi Yochanan learns Rabbi Chanina, Rabbi Meir understood Rabbi Chanina is talking about Basr that was Tomei Mi De Ra Banan. That's how, that's what Rabbi Zayde is telling Rabbi Asi. Yeah, let, let, let's take a look at Rashi. Let's take a look at Rashi. Name a of Rabbi Yochanan. The Mishnah is talking about Avlada Tumadirabonan. 
for Reb Meir Minei Aleph, and Reb Meir learns it from there. Says Rashi Vaiter, V'davke nokat sheish Reb Yochanan. And according to this, Reb Zayd is saying, Reb Yochanan meant only the sixth hour, only 11 o'clock. Only because it's inedible rabbinically. It's, it's, it's rabbinically prohibited. What if you want to burn it at 10 or 9? I it's anyway going to be perished. It's going into a fire. But the love of Rabbi Yeshua Kayalif. He's not learning it from Rabbi Yeshua. The time of Rabbi Yeshua has to Mishum have Sidchulin. Perhaps Rabbi Yochanan learns you could never learn it from Rabbi Yeshua because Rabbi Yeshua only said you're allowed to make Truma Tame if it's going to be a huge financial loss. But here there's no huge financial loss. So if you would learn it from Rabbi Yeshua, you could say even 9 o'clock in the morning you could be at Matame. But he's not learning it from Rabbi Yeshua. He's learning it only from Reb Chanin. And Reb Chanin says it has to be inedible. 9 o'clock, it's edible. 9 o'clock, it's good Truma. It's edible. There's no Isur on it. How could you destroy it? How could you make it tame? How could you make it tame? 11 o'clock, it's inedible. 9 o'clock, it's edible. You're not going to make it tame. 9 o'clock, it's edible, Midrabanon, too. 11 o'clock, it's inedible, Midrabanon. So Reb Chanina says, then I could learn from Reb Chanina that what? You told me that Basu, that's tame, Midrabanon, I could bump up. Here it's an edible midrabbanon. I can make it tummy even with a tumma dairaisa. Because the truma to hide the truma to me is dairaisa. But nine o'clock in the morning? Sorry. I Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Yeshua was only talking about hefsed. So when Rabbi Yechanan said the machloikas is sheish, he means sheish. Eleven, not nine, not ten, not eight. Why is the Bzeda asking this question? He says, Oidilma Rabbi Yechanan nami Rabbi Mehmed Rabbi Yeshua Yalaf. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Rabbi Yochanan holds that Rabbi Meir learns it from Rabbi Yeshua. The time of the Rabbi Meir, love Meshum is Surah the Rabbanon. And Rabbi Meir doesn't believe you're allowed to make a tummy because it's inedible rabbinically. Even 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, you're allowed to make a tummy because he holds like Rabbi Yeshua that if it's going to be destroyed, even though now it's edible, you're good. When Rabbi Yochanan said the sixth hour, he was just using common language. He meant before the seventh hour, but even the fifth hour, the fourth hour, the third hour. So Rashi is saying the whole thought. When the Zayda asked Rabbi Asi, does Rabbi Yochanan believe Rabbi Meir is learning it from Rabbi Chanina? It's very bediyuk, because if he's learning it from Rabbi Chanina, it's sheish, only 11. If he's learning it from Rabbi Yeshua, it could be nine, ten. So why would Rabbi Yechonon say machloikas b'sheish? He just means machloikas is before the seventh hour. By the seventh hour, everybody holds you could be at Matame. Even Reb Yosi. The machloikas is b'sheish or b'sheish or b'chamesh or b'arba or b'shalosh. Or no, Rabbi Yechonon means sheish, 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 only sheish because he's learning it from Reb Chanin. That's that's the vart. Reb Zayda asks Reb Asi, we heard something from Reb Yochanan. I want to now take Reb Yochanan's words, go back to the Mishnah, and see how he learned Reb Meir. Is it true that he learned Reb Meir as seeing his source as Reb Chanina? And then I would understand Machloikas B'Sheish in one way, Dafka Sheish. Or maybe that's a wrong interpretation. Maybe it's a wrong interpretation. Maybe Dafka is learning from Rabbi Yeshua, and therefore mm-hmm. he is allowed to burn at them. Amalei, Reb Asi told Reb Zayde in, you're right. That's exactly how Reb Yechina learns the Mishnah. He learns the Mishnah that we're talking about Reb Chanin is gan hakoyanim, and therefore Machloikas is b'sheish. So Reb Zayde asked Reb Asi, is it true that Reb Yechina believes Reb Meir's source was Reb Chanin is gan hakoyanim? And as Rashi learned it, and that means sheish is precisely. All like Rabbi Yeshua, and that means sheish is not precisely. So he answered, you're right. He's learning it from Rabbi Chanina, and therefore Machloikas is only b'sheish. Itmar Nami, we have a source for this. Amir Rabbi Yechanan, Rabbi Yechanan said, this is a new, Rabbi Zayda didn't know about this. The base manager said, Rabbi Yechanan said, Masnis in our Mishnah is talking about Ava Tumah Dei Raisa. Uvlad Hatumah Dei Rabbanan. Clear statement that Rabbi Yochanan said all this. 
The Mishnah learns it from Reb Chanina's Gana Koyanim. The Machloikus is Besheish. Besheva, everybody agrees you could burn it. And Reb Chanina believes that it's talking about, Ed Meir believes that Reb Chanina was talking about Tumah de Rabbana. Perhaps we have great support for Rabbi Yochanan from the following Braisa, which we actually quoted earlier. You have three types of meat that have to be burnt. Pigul. You remember what pigul is? Pigul is that when I was doing the carbon, I had in mind to do the avoid in the wrong time. For example, I'm going to eat the meat in a week. I'm going to sprinkle the blood tomorrow or tonight. Remember three rules. When you shech the carbon, the blood has to be sprinkled by sunset, not later. The fat has to be consumed by the morning. The eating has to be done by next night. Okay, so you have three different halachas. The blood always has to be the same day till sunset. Yeah. The eating could be today, tonight, and many carbonas even another day. In other words, I have till tomorrow sunset. Unless it's a carbon that I have only today and tonight. And the burning of the fat on the mezbeach could be done today and all night till the morning. Hector chalavim veivarim. Could be done throughout the night. Pigul means in any of these, I thought I'm going to do it in the wrong time. I'm going to burn the fat tomorrow morning. I'm going to eat it in three days. I'm going to sprinkle the blood at midnight. That makes it pigul. To eat it is karis. It has to be burnt. The chachamim also said it should be tame, but not biblically. Noiser means you actually leave it over. You leave it over physically. Pigul is you had a thought to leave it over Noiser is you actually leave it over and you have to burn it also. The Chachamim said it's Tameh. But I it's not Tameh. And Tameh means it's actually Tameh. All three meats have to be burnt. You're not allowed to eat any of them. They have to be burnt. The difference is the third one is biblically Tameh. And the first two are not biblically Tameh. So Bishamai says do not burn them together. Why? Because you're going to take Pigul and Noiser and be it Metame Minatayri. You're going to make it Tameh. You're not allowed to make it Tameh. Ait Tameh Midra Bonan. It's only Tameh Midra Bonan, but not Minatayra. So you're not allowed to bump it up in the same fire. You could burn them all together. Reb Yoisi brought this Machloikas earlier in the Braisa to refute Reb Meir. What, what did he try to say? He tried to say that Beis Hillel only lets you be Metameh, be a dying Pigul and Noiser. Why Pigul and Noiser? Because Pigul and Noiser are inedible Minatayra. Beishamai says you're not allowed to, but Beishilil says they're inedible menatayris, you're allowed to. But Truma, which is Asr only midir 11 o'clock, you wouldn't be allowed to. So what do we see from here? Rabbi Yaisi brought this b'raisa earlier to refute Reb Meir. The Gemara quoted it earlier on the top of the page. How does this b'raisa refute Reb Meir? It's support for Rabbi Yaisi that you're not allowed to burn Truma Tahira with Tmeya on Erev Pesach. How is it a support for him? Because even Beis Hillel, who's lenient, he says you can burn Pigul, Noiser, and Tameh. But all of them are inedible min But Truma Tahira, 11 o'clock, is edible min So perhaps this is a great support for Rabbi Yochanan. That Rabbi Yossi would agree for Rabbi Yochanan about Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yochanan said that Rabbi Yossi would agree that 12 o'clock you're allowed to be metam of the truma when you burn it. I have a great proof. Rabbi Yossi brought Beis Hillel as a support for him. I like Beis Hillel. What did Beis Hillel say? You're allowed to burn pigul, noiser, and tamay. Why? You're making it more tamay. You're bumping up the tuma. The answer is because it's inedible biblically. To quote Rashi, Ein lecha tuma g'dayla mizu. It's like chametz, 12 o'clock. Pigul is chametz. It's also karis. <laughs> Pigul is chametz. So who cares if it's tamay? You're not going to be a metame because it's, it's holy. It's holy that you can't eat. Who cares? Be it metame. Great proof to Rabbi Yochanan because Rabbi Yossi brings this as a proof to refute Rabbi Meir. Pigul and Noiser, yeah. True or no. Why not? Why pigul better? Why is pigul worse than chametz? The answer is because 11 o'clock you're allowed to eat chametz. Biblically. Biblically. But you're not allowed to eat pigul. You understood? So this is a great proof for Rabbi Yochanan. L'chayda, great proof for Rabbi Yochanan. In other words, the Gemara understands that the reason Beis Hillel is being matir, the joining together of these three meats is because 
it's inedible. That's the word. It's not raw you to do the mitzvah. You can't eat this carbon. Sorry. You're not allowed to. It's noiser, it's pigle, and it's uh, it's uh, tame. It's 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 burning being burnt with tame. Says the Gemara, no, 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 no proof. Shiny hosim, the islu tuma midirabanan. They have another quality. They're inedible, that's true, but they also tummy midirabana. The Tanan, the Mishnah says, it's the end of Psachim. Hapigul vahanoisim etamana sayadayim. The Chachamim made a gzeira, a iser, a tumma. Pigul and noiser, amitame your hands. A koyin who touches pigul and noiser, his hands become tame. They did, they did this for a reason, because there were lazy koyhanim who would leave over noiser, and there were koyanim who were sometimes obnoxious, and they would do pigul, and they would say it was a mistake, and then the poor guy has to bring a new carbon. And if you had an enemy, it was a great way of getting back at him. You know, he brings his big axe for a carbon. And you're like the kind of, Oi, you won't believe, Chaim Yankel, you won't believe what happened. I had this crazy thought that I'm going to eat it in nine days. He just paid $900. It was a mistake. If it was amazing, you'll have to pay him, but it was a mistake. So this is a very sweet way of revenge. We're not talking about the holiest, uh, most refined people. So the Chachamim were very sensitive to all of this. And the Kayanim were always scared of Tumah because Tumah was a major problem. Because if you got Tame from the carbon, you had to go, you had to put the hands in the mikveh. So they would try to avoid it by all costs. And therefore they made a gzair of Tumah on Pigul and Noiser Midirabana. If so, you could say, Basilil holds because it's Tame Midirabanan. It's not just inedible, it's Tame Midirabanan. Therefore, we can already bump up the Tumah. Because it's not only inedible minatayr, it's also tame. So therefore, I let you burn it with tame because you're just being moist of tumma. So inedible is good, but you have to add the idea that the meat is already tame midirabona. But trumas chametz, 12 o'clock, is inedible, but it's tahar. It's pure. So now we can go back to a different perspective and say it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. You can argue it's inedible, but it's not tame. And therefore, to be at metame, you need a gewaldike chiddush. You don't have a proof from this, from this din of Basilil. You don't have a proof. And therefore, you could say Rabbi Yossi doesn't believe that 12 o'clock you're allowed to be metame. Ah, he brings Basilil. Basilil is a separate halacha. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.